Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the James and T Podcast Record Club, where each week one of us picks a record for the other people to review, and then we review it. And this week we are doing a special episode just because this happens to be this album's 30th anniversary, 30th anniversary of a pretty particularly uh, revered album from one of the podcast's favorite artists and one of my favorite artists in general, that being Nick Cave and his band Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, their 1992 record, Henry's Dream. And this is a curious little record to talk about just because this has always been one of my, if not my favorite Nick Cave record held for a small period of time. This was my favorite record like ever. And uh, it has still remained uh, one of my favorite albums, and it is definitely very well regarded. But in the terms of like the upper echelon of Nick Cave's career, I think that while it's certainly considered to be upper tier, it kind of gets lost amongst the uh, tender praise, the Boatman's Calls, the even to a lesser extent, Skeleton's Tree, like other records just happen to overshadow it just because he has so many canonical entries mm. in this particular post-punk gothic rock sound. He was also releasing like so many records, like he was so prolific that like it was easy to just kind of... 85, 86 had two albums actually, then 88 had one and then 1990 and this was 92. And so I, th- I think the like the legacy or like the the lasting impact of this record was kind of overshadowed by the fact that the next Nick Cave record was Let Lovin', which was kind of the record mm-hmm. where he blew up like commercially. That was yep. where he started to be like a really like not that he wasn't successful already, but he started to have more crossover appeal there. And so I think Henry's dream kind of gets it seems to have more been reappraised, I think, in recent years, and mm-hmm. seems to be one of his most beloved now. When I see Nick Cave rankings, it's usually pretty high. Um, but it still, I think, feels a little bit alongside the Good Son, which is the record he made just before it. It feels like these two records are kind of like people are sort of catching up now with how great these records are, and um, they can kind of get lost in the flow a little bit. So I'm glad that we're talking about this one. Yeah, like it comes off of, I think that's sort of mostly accepted that Nick Cave's first truly exceptional, like canonical album is Tender Prey. And then immediately after that, you have The Good Son. And The Good Son is kind of like the polar opposite to Tender Prey in a lot of ways, because Tender Prey is this really heavily gothic really eccentric post-punk record and then the good son is while it does have elements of post-punk and gothic rock the sort of piano rock element of nick cave sound was fully integrated here so it's a little bit more i would actually venture to say that it's comparatively more tasteful so then after you have the good son you sort of have the 90s era of nick cave which honestly is highly comparable to the 90s era of uh, an artist who often gets compared to nick cave which is tom waits where he kind of gets a little bit more ambitious with his album structuring his the sonic directions that he goes in and storytelling in particular which is what's most notable about Henry's Dream is while this isn't a concept album I would consider it to be a sort of anthology series about a particular like western town that Nick is always kind of evoking you always get a real sense of place from all of these songs that he's recording and up until this point he hadn't really done anything in terms of like an album uh, that is like overall overarchingly conceptual, more storytelling that's limited to the song that it is within. And so with Henry's Dream, you sort of see a trend that would be picked up on, on like murder ballads, for instance. So I think that even if like, regardless of what you think about the album, the sort of root of most of his beloved records in that era is found here and in my opinion capitalized on brilliantly we have the opening track here papa won't leave you henry which god god what a stunning stunning song um uh i love the way i mean it's kind of it's interesting actually is that nick has i don't know if he's amended this statement but retrospectively he he said that this album turned out to be a little bit more cleanly produced than what he originally had in mind. And I find that interesting just because this isn't a, you know, it isn't a particularly, um, uh, you know, ramshackle record. I mean, a lot of his earlier albums definitely sound a little bit more grimy. Um, But the particular just sort of presence of all these instruments and especially the way the guitar sounds, like the opening, the boom, the sort of like strumming is so like, 
organic sounding and all that's kind of what I think is so remarkable about this is that after this on Let Love In, he capitalizes on having such a huge, huge array of different instruments and like a band that is genuinely like coming through with this really massive pummeling sound and here it's like the sort of track starts off very simply with this sort of organic instruments and as it goes on it just sort of layers itself more and more and more eventually you get like a fiddle that comes through and really adds a sense of kind of theatricality to it which is another I think present element of this album that I find particularly compelling is the sort of theatricality of it all is that this is sort of a moment where you see Nick embody several different characters and telling the story of several different characters, but also just a sense of almost camp and theatricality that feels very, I mean, it feels like a stage performance almost. And just the quintessential Nick Cave lyricism here of just talking about this depraved place. Uh, the one lyrical stick out is uh, um, him getting or getting knocked out drunk and then having a man drag his dick across his cheek, um, which will never, never not be funny. Um, but just the way this kind of crescendos with the sort of the fiddles, the, the just kind of ascending in these chord progressions that are really, really satisfying. And Nick just at the very end of this song, like he just kind of continues on like with the chorus, except like he just kind of keeps rambling and he sounds fucking crazy he's just like the death squads and the babies being born without brains he's just losing his fucking mind and you just go from this really highly orchestrated track to you know that sense of chaos that uh nick is so good at invoking in a primordial sense that it's it's just one of my it's always been one of my favorite openers to any nick cave album I hard, hard agree. It's a fantastic song. With regards to like production and sound, like one of the things that struck me revisiting this was because um, I hadn't listened to this record in a couple of years, was just like how much denser the sound was than I remembered it being. Mm-hmm. And with a couple of exceptions, I mean, there's some, a couple of songs that are quieter, but like there's so much happening in these songs that I can kind of see Nick's complaint about the mixing. There's a brightness mm-hmm. to the way that this all sounds. Yeah. It's produced very cleanly, as you say. And I can see why Nick would want it to have, I guess, a more gruff and rough shot sound or presentation overall. Have you ever checked out the Live Seeds uh, live album that was that they did on the tour for this record? No, actually, I have not. Okay, because um, one of the reasons why that live album was released in 93 was specifically to do because Nick wanted to do the songs in this record better justice by capturing how they sounded in a live setting. And I hadn't heard it either, but I checked out a couple of the versions of the songs on this record. Um, specifically my two of my favorite songs in this record, which are Papa and Levy Henry and John Finn's wife. And the absolute intensity and the heft that these songs have in a live setting is cert- captured to some extent on the record, but I think there's something that's lost in the cleanness of it. The song that suffers the most on the record from production, uh, and it's it's still a song that I think sounds great here, but it's a song that I think is one of Nick's best songs ever. And I love the song. I just think that it sounds better. First of all, it sounds better in the remix version of this record, and it sounds better in the live setting, and it sounds better just about everywhere else. And I think this is just a me thing, because I haven't really seen anyone else make this complaint, but one of Nick's best songs ever, straight to you, love the song song on here love the song there's just something about the version on this record that sounds too shrill or like just too intense and too loud and too there's some nuances and beauty in the song that i think are kind of a little bit lost in the way that it's recorded here but it doesn't ruin the song completely it just i think i I benefit from having heard alternate versions of it it's a great song anyway forget my complaint it's an amazing song uh, it's gorgeous. It represents, I think, Nick getting in touch with uh, a sort of tenderness, no pun intended, mm-hmm. that he would lean more into throughout the rest of the 90s. And it's kind of melded here with kind of the more caustic side of him and the more aggressive side of him that came out of the 80s really beautifully. It's a gorgeous love song. Um, it's the kind of love song from Nick that has that sort of violent energy to it that makes you feel like it wouldn't really fit in as well on any of his other records. Like it's not morbid enough to fit on on murder ballads and it's not quite pretty and tender enough to fit in on, you know, Boatman's Call. It's just perfectly 
encapsulates this particular era i think and it's a it's an amazing amazing song yeah that is additionally my favorite song on here and it's really just because of nick's really colorful vocal performance which is something he's always been known for but here i just i love the sense of like you're right it is there's sort of a grandiosity to the song of talking about you know the world feeling like this apocalyptic crumbling thing and taking refuge in this one person. And it still manages to have that sort of quintessential theatricality that this album has that's kind of continued from uh, the first couple of songs. I just wanted to mention the, um, like one of my favorite lyrical passages is on Papa Won't Leave You, Henry, which is, well, the moon, it looked exhausted, like something you should pity, spent an age spotted above the sizzling wires of the city. Well, it reminded me of her face, her bleached and hungry eyes. Her hair was like a curtain falling open with laughter and closing with the lies. And the ghost of her still lingers on, though she's passed through me and is gone. Well, the slum dog they're barking the rain children on the streets and the tears that we will weep today will all be washed away by the tears that we will weep we will weep again tomorrow which is just like th- this dude is at his lyrical fucking peak after tender prey and does not stop in this decade which is mainly i think what like the each sort of 90s nick cave record carries on distinctly as a strength is just each one of these songs is so well written so well realized um or even something like you know straight to you really kind of gives you a sort of emotional crux that you kind of need at this point yet just because papa won't leave you henry and even i had a dream joe or feel more like they're relaying uh, a scene or a character rather than maybe a conflict or a struggle necessarily. That said, after that, you have something like Brother, My Cup is Empty, which I think is just one of the best bangers Nick has ever come out with. Just, again, the portraiture of this place that Nick is talking about, this sort of like old, dusty Western town is just so vivid and stark. And you kind of get the impression that like Nick is sort of like a character that's sort of like an old Sergio Sergio Leone Western character wandering through this town. And like, there's lots of different like Western tropes that it plays on in songs like John Finn's Wife, which also that's another one of my favorite songs in here too, which I, I love. Love the storytelling here of Nick, you know, just being this suave cowboy who, you know, finds this woman in a bar uh, and uh, essentially seduces her and then gets caught in the act and then is tries to, uh, the person who's married to her tries to kill him. And you get a lot of those like straightforward narratives here that feel like like I always said that, like, if I ever became a film director, I would always want to adapt Henry's dream as a movie as like an anthology series of like yeah. Western shorts because it always presents a really vivid, really fun kind of upbeat picture that no matter how like crass or terrifying Nick's lyrics uh, can be, which they very often are, uh, you sort of still get a sense of, of liveliness to all of this that's not too dour, that's not too apocalyptic or, or scary or um, just overwhelming. He seems to know the the line to tread. And while I do understand, and I will have to check out just the other versions of their performance wise for the sake of production, um, I will say that there is a sort of the cleanness and the brightness of the instrumentation here kind of lends to the sort of dreamlike quality that this album has that I do think ends up being in mostly its benefit for my uh, taste, but just the fact that there all are multiple versions of it, just that makes me very, very happy. Yeah, there's like a, a sense of theatricality to the presentation that I think is intentional to a certain extent, right? Because you look at the album cover where it's like a billboard that's lit up, right? And so you have mm-hmm. Nick leaning into this sort of theatrical aspect of his music. Like I think he, the way that he, this is all packaged and the way that these songs are told, like it has this sense of a vaudeville, you know, esque quality to it where you know you're being presented uh, a story, you know you're being presented and set into this landscape. I mean, you mentioned Sergio Leone, and I, I think a lot when I listen to this record of Sam Peckinpah and his particular vision yeah. of, of the West as this kind of like incredibly violent place where man's, specifically men's worst instincts kind of come to the surface and dominate. And, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, and there's like some Cormac McCarthy in here as well. And in songs like Jonathan's oh, yeah. Wife, the way that like the characters in this song are kind of like depicted 
in this kind of inhuman way. Like um, I, I love the depiction of this uh, titular character, this woman who isn't even named, of course, she's always regarded only with regard to her relationship to this male char character who barely is even in the song. But the way she's described, like, with legs like scissors and butcher's knives, tattooed breast and flaming eyes, and a crimson carnation in her teeth carving her way through the dance floor, like, there's such a, a, a brutality to the way that, and a kind of animalistic fury to the way that these characters are described. Like, this character of John Finn's wife is equally this you know this conquest that he sees but also this enigmatic and terrifying figure to the narrator of the story too this thing that cannot be understood this this woman that is so alien to to them and to everyone else around in this sort of setting uh, i find that really you know potent and and kind of it gets your attention and it gets you involved in the story. Uh, when I first came to town as well as another highlight on the record for me, mm. another great sense of, of storytelling where he kind of evokes these Western tropes of, you know, the stranger, the traveler, you know, who arrives in this particular landscape and soon enough, he's arousing suspicion among the locals. And he has this sense to him of, being doomed of of there being he says like there's sweet jesus there's no turning back there's always one more town a little further down the track and it's this sort of like almost like i don't know lovecraftian horror like below Stephen the surface King's the dark tower perhaps yeah stephen king and of course king was heavily influenced by lovecraft as well so it all mm. goes through the same um set of things but like yeah it is the kind of album that feels like it's taken from the same sort of world or pool of 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 influences and emotions as a lot of stephen king's uh, 80s and 90s work uh in specific so yeah and the dark tower as well i think is a, is a great reference point too it's just it's a really evocative album in that sense i like the way that every character that we are put into the perspective of yeah feels the strong not just a strong sense of alienation from the people around him but almost like a a sense of he is the only real human that he could possibly understand and everything else that he regards is is something that's foreign to him and out of his reach um even with straight to you right which is the most kind of like straightforward you know sort of love song on this record there's like the sense of unknowing that he, he where he feels captured and and helpless like you know the prey of, of the woman that he is in love with and yeah it's it's a really emotionally complicated record that is i don't like to use this kind of cliche language but it is a kind of portrait of masculinity in a certain sense uh mm -hmm. and the way in which men both see themselves as aggressors and as victims um, but it's not, you know, preachy about that or anything like that. It just it, it mm. gives you an insight into the underlying emotions and archetypes of these characters and, and the sort of psychological things that they they draw from. And, and anyway, I think it's meaningful then that the song kind of uh, that the album sort of climaxes with a song called Jack the Ripper, where you have this archetype of, you know, unknowable horror evoked in the context of this relationship between this male figure and this woman who it seems to him to be both an aggressor and a conquest. Um, she strikes me down with a fist of lead. Uh, I awake with a hatchet hanging over her head. She screams out Jack the Ripper every time I try to give this girl a kiss. Um, and the way it ends with him just kind of intoning, oh yeah, like over and over again, it's the sultry, mm -hmm. just sinister uh, sexual violence um that i just it's so it's pure cave like that he's all about this kind of vibe at this particular point in his career and it's it's a very unsettling record for that and and you can never quite get a grasp on what's real and what isn't the fact that let love in comes after this feels so like natural considering he goes so like all out with 
his like really colorful vocal deliveries like just the way he opens up jack the ripper with like i got a woman <laughs> she rolls my house with an iron fist like every single song he really just kind of or even on um brother my cup is empty like the further he gets into the song he's like brother my cup is empty and i haven't got a penny like every single time it really does feel like you're watching a theatrical performance and in between each song nick cave is like coming out in a different outfit and with like yeah. makeup on and just like prostrating himself before a, a bunch of people <laughs> just and how melodramatic he sounds the, the melodrama is definitely like part of what makes it so special is that it like it does really combine all of these ideas of it's like it is kind of like humorous and funny in parts and like gothic and like macabre and like there is an element of horror to all of it and then there is like a sincerity here that's on stuff like i i had a dream joe or straight to you mm. where it's just like it really does feel like even though this album is doing something incredibly specific it's done so with such a holistic like vibe that it may manages to like really feel like a like a complete fleshed out fully formed experience that always feels really transportative to me and that's kind of the magic of this album is that how it, it really just it's a very specific construction but every element of that construction is so well thought out and so like brazenly executed even on the albums like strictly weirder moments like uh christina the astonishing which is one of his weirdest vocal deliveries like i love the way it's like he sort of comically kind of starts extending his notes just like christina the astonishing was the most astonishing of all yeah <laughs> <laughs> he kind of leans into it a little bit much for me there and the song is a little bit too sparse for me it's not one of the moments i connect with more but i mean it's got plenty of that eccentricity that we love and nick and i feel like a song i haven't mentioned a song that is kind of like you know mentioned straight to straight to you as this you know love song but the mm. really the most tender song on this record is loom of the land which mm, is land, just like yeah almost unequivocally tender and like there's no mm -hmm. or very little like sinister undertones to it um there's a couple of lines that you know have a bit of a strange like, unsettling feel to them like the moon in the sky like a dislodged crown in my hands they burn mm. in the folds of her coat um one of many many references like nick has these uh recurring motifs he loves to go back to the moon is one of them uh across his entire career and um yeah there's just something very uh it's, it's it's very unequivocally uncomplicatedly tender but there's also like in the context of this record that's disarming when it happens mm -hmm. and like especially between so. between john finn's wife and, and then going into jack the ripper like i mean if you could think about the sequencing here like this is a song about intoning this woman sweet sally to rest her head upon your shoulder and then in the next song the female character is like you know out to kill this male character it's the sense of um paranoia and stuff like you're never allowed to be feeling a particular emotion or in a particular state for too long before that all just gets upended it's part of i guess the frenetic you know uh, exciting and just jagged experience of a nick cave record in this particular era the pacing i think also really has a lot to do with that too is that it's so consistently exciting and these like these not this is 40 minutes long and it's nine songs this is a really tight record like you can really feel it like there's not an extraneous like moment of fat on here everything here feels defined and it feels really like at peace with the other songs here but everything does feel distinct enough to carve out sort of its own identity as an individual song without feeling too scattershot or too weird it's it's it, it's just and this album is maybe like it for a long time it was my favorite nick cave album and it's vying for it now. I might say Ghostine these days. I might say this. I might say The Boatman's Call. There's He's got too many perfect albums. What can I say? But th I think the thing that impresses me the most about this album that makes me come back to this, other than the fact that it just has a lot of aesthetic things that I really love just the whole like you know the gothic western shit the horror shit the 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 pulpiness the theatricality it's just very much me but the one thing about it is that like artistically it's just an immaculate balancing act he has to basically ride the line between so many aspects of his persona of his sound of just like he has to basically strike 
an even middle ground that doesn't alienate anybody, but also exposes everyone to his weird idiosyncrasies and he has to make certain that nothing is dulled but also do it so that it doesn't feel completely fucking impenetrable and it doesn't like maybe you know scare people away like some of his earlier records might so it really does feel like a culminating record of just like this is sort of when nick was fully formed as an artist from uh the rest of his career onward like maybe this is an sort of maybe the the best example of an album that benefits from being a transitional record is that you can find pretty much every aspect of what came before it but it also just sort of set the stage for everything that came after it too and so i think it could be very well argued that this is nick cave's most important album when it comes to his trajectory as an artist well i mean i couldn't i can't say it better than that really definitely a record worth celebrating on its 30th anniversary or shortly after its 30th anniversary as we are uh and a record where if you have checked out a few nick cave records but you've overlooked this one or if you're new to him entirely definitely a record that i think will if anything else get you energized to listen to more nick cave because this thing just be- fucking beats the door down straight away in the opening seconds and immediately tells you that Nick is a force to be reckoned with and an interesting. It's not quite as immense of an undertaking as say like murder ballads might be just because that's a little bit further into some of the weirder and longer shit that he's like, mm. I, I, I'd say that Henry's dream is maybe the quintessential beginners start here with Nick Cave's music record. My only uh, reservation there would be that I think that a lot of what he does here is, is, Certainly the focus shifts, but I think that Let Lovin is slightly more refined than this. And um, I like the sound of that record a little bit more. And I think it's a bit more consistent, but. Uh, it's also a bit more batshit though. Like just to the point where it might alienate people, which I mean, I love that about that album. That's another perfect record in my opinion, but it's also just kind of like, that might be a bit much. Mm. Well, we'd be interested to hear what the audience at home think as well. So don't be afraid to let us know in the comments below what you think of this record and let love it and how they compare. But before we wrap up, let's do our favorite tracks and ratings. Uh, Jake, why don't you go first? Difficult task just because this is an album of perfect and near perfect songs and nothing else. Uh, So I'm going to say my three favorite songs on here are Straight to You... Papa Won't Leave You, Henry, and I'll say, yeah, John Finn's Wife. Uh, least favorite? I don't really have one. This is, this. I mean, this is just a, a, a quintessential Jake Perfect record for me. 10 out of 10. Awesome. Uh, I have loaded in Morgan's rating of 8 out of 10 because he's, of course, heard this as well. My three favorite tracks are actually the same as you, Jake. Uh, Papa Won't Leave You, Henry, Straight to You, and Jonathan's Wife. Least favorite is Christina the Astonishing, and um, it gets a very effusive and very strong 7.5 from me. Uh, a record I, I, I maybe appreciate more than love in comparison to the records around it, but it's a very important album and a very enjoyable one too, which means that we have an average overall of 8.5 for Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, Henry's Dream. Let us know what you think of this record in the comments below, or if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, head on over to the YouTube link in the description and let us know via that way. Uh, If you want more Nick Cave content from us, we actually have quite a bit. Morgan has done a ranking of every, a tier list ranking of every Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds album. It's actually one of our most viewed videos, I think, since we started doing music content on this channel. So check that out. I'll put a link to that in the description below as well. We've also talked about Nick Cave in the Record Club series in the past as well. We did a Record Club episode on Ghosting, which is actually low-key one of my favorite record clubs we did last year i really think that that was a special video and we did a really good job talking about that album we also reviewed the new record that nick cave put out with warren ellis last year carnage as well you can put a link to that below too and i have no doubt absolutely no doubt whatsoever that there will be more nick cave content to come in the future he's just a perfect uh artist for the record club format and we can't say enough good things about him so Uh, If you enjoyed the video, if you enjoyed the podcast, make sure that you give it a like or a five-star rate and review. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel if you have not already so you don't miss future episodes of this series. 
If you want to go above and beyond and support the channel even more, you can hit the join button on our YouTube page. And for just $1 a month, you can become a direct supporter, one of our best friends. You get your name featured in the title call of every video on this channel, priority comment response. And if you want to recommend us a record to listen to, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. As always, though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Disneyland, the happiest place on earth.